Hi, I'm Gary Knoll. Once again, I welcome you to our Classroom on the Air. The theme today is artificial intelligence. First, what they're talking about. They're talking about wonderful opportunities for us to improve the quality of our lives, especially if you have illnesses. Why? Because let's just say that you have some form of neurological problem, uh, something that could lead to multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, dementia, ALS, something that's deadly and really takes away quality of life. But artificial intelligence has taken all the knowledge in the world from all the medical textbooks and all the medical experiences and put it into finding a solution. Let's just say that you have a disease in your kidney or your liver and the doctors don't know what to do about it or the procedures they would apply wouldn't necessarily be that much of an improvement. Artificial intelligence is supposed to give the answer to that. And also part of artificial intelligence is helping in the genetic sequencing to be able to grow a new liver, a new heart, even grow a new skin. So that no matter what your age, with artificial intelligence, transhumanism and genetics, they can gene therapy, they can reverse your aging skin reverse your aging muscle mass. In effect, they can make you over. And for a lot of people, that's important. But also think about all the people who are simply lonely. Young people are lonely because they're not out and about, in part because of COVID, but also because there's more of an emphasis upon uh, keeping a distance and viewing life as a spectator, a passive spectator who is living through being a voyeur to life. You can go all over the world with TikTok and see little short clips of everything being done. And you can just spend all day just immersed in someone else's exhibitionism, whatever they're doing. But how much of this really enhances our well-being? How about none of it? We no longer have the concept of the Socrates garden where Socrates, the great philosopher, would sit with his students and debate the issues of life and come up with reasoned choices. We've had great minds throughout all of our history, but they have not been dominant in their time. Frequently, they've been obscured, like Spinoza, or they have not been embraced, as they should have, even by Hippocrates. So you can go back a 1,000 or 2,000 years and still find things that can inspire us today. But we believe none of that is important. History doesn't matter. If we don't like this, we'll just rewrite it. Okay. And artificial intelligence does our thinking for us. In fact, artificial intelligence promises with this new technology available right now, it would have been available two years ago when they would take a little piece of your skull, open it up, and put what was about the size of a quarter, but it had wires coming out of it into your cranium, and that could control a lot of the impulse within the body and the brain. And for some medical conditions, it might be able to help. But now they can do it without those wires. I was talking about the chip over 15 years ago. And people thought it was absurd. What do you mean putting a chip in? Well, now, right now, a lot of people are getting the chip. Why? Because if you forget your keys, you just go up to your car, boom. Put up your hand, it's right embedded right here between the thumb and the forefinger. And it's about the size of a, of a grain of sand. It's tiny. Same thing going to work. Now you don't have to take out your you know, card, identity card. No, just put your hand up or just walk through. It'll scan your whole body and you get right in. And you think that's great, it's a convenience. And so the marketing of all of this artificial intelligence and its offshoots in many different areas is to make your life simpler so that you really don't even have to work. I don't have to work? Yeah, that's a benefit. Now, of course, the dark side of that is how are you going to support yourself? What will be your options if they're taking away the options? Yeah, you don't need cash. Cash is dirty. It has bacteria on it and viruses on it. One dollar bill, for example, had, it was measured, had over 3,000 different viruses and bacteria on it. Oh, I don't want that. 
You don't have to have that anymore because everyone is going towards a digital currency. You have a card. That card has all your identity on it. And all you do is just touch that card and it tells you how much money you have that you can take out. Or when you put money in, you do it all with a card. All transactions are no longer with cash. And once they come for your cash, they're going to come for your gold and silver. And people think that's okay, because a lot of people don't have cash. And a lot of people would love to have less work and guarantees. And that's built into the system. Part of it's scientific, artificial intelligence, but part of it's political. The more rights a person or a corporation, they call themselves stakeholders, not shareholders. Shareholder owns some stock in a company. They can buy and sell those shares as the stock goes up or stock comes down. Shareholder owns, owns you. They own the banks. They own the financial system. They own the food production system. So when the food production system says, and those running it over the next two to three years, you will eat insects and we will make the insects taste like normal food. Okay. And they'll try to convince you why growing insects and, uh, and eating them is good for your health and saves the planet. Neither is true. Insects have diseases, fungus, bacteria, and viruses that have never been tested in any study of what you do to your body when you bring these in. But it's a great marketing plan now. Then they go to the idea that you will own nothing. They've said this. It's in their writing. You will own nothing and you'll be happy. I will own nothing? What about my car? You won't own it. You'll rent a car. You'll rent the space where you live. How does that work? Well, we're going to take away all that debt that you have. You'll be debt free. But you'll also be asset free. You won't own anything. You won't owe anything, but you won't uh, you won't owe anything. What if I'm a person that would like to own my own clothes? You don't need to, because each day you'll be able to select the clothes you want and we'll have that delivered to you. You'll be able to order in the food you want and the, actually the cooking utensils and pets and pans, and you'll be able to make your meal. Now, when you go to work or you go out, someone else will come in and take over the use of that space till you come back. So many different people could be using my space. Yeah. What control will I have? Well, you'll be able to control things that we say are fine. For example, if we don't want you eating a particular food, you won't be able to get it. If we don't want you traveling someplace because it'll increase your carbon footprint, you can't travel. Hold on a second. You're, you're traveling in private jets. We understand you might be concerned, but our traveling in private jets is not the issue. It's to keep the masses from traveling in jets at all. So we're creating a city in Oxford, true story, creating a city in Oxford, England, where Oxford University is, that's called a 15-minute city, meaning you're allowed to go anywhere within 15 minutes, and you can't go anywhere without being monitored. So there's a card or a chip, that when you go outside of 15 minutes from where you live, you're then given a hundred trips that you can take, and then you're fined in a year. In a year? What if I work in a city, but I live in a town? Doesn't matter. Each time you go to work, that'll be charged against you. So, by going to work, if it's 15 minutes further from where I live, I'll be fined after 100 stops? Yes. Wow. Why is this a good idea? Well, because everything you need will be within 15 minutes. All the stores and schools and anything that we deem, we, not you, deem important, you'll be able to find within 15 minutes. That way you can bite, therefore less pollution. We're doing our part for global warming, but we're insisting by mandate and law, you do the same. So I can bike around this area. Yes. I can walk. Yeah. I jog. Yeah. I can drive as long as within 15 minutes. Yeah. 
But you're going to know because my car will be monitored. I will personally be monitored. Yes. Small sacrifice. I see. So what happens when I still have to go to work and I've done more than 100 trips? There's 365 days in a year. And uh, if I'm out there traveling five days a week, I'm going to exceed, I'm going to double my 100, 100 uh, uh, opportunities. Well, you know, that'll come out automatically out of your pay. How's that? Well, we're controlling all your money, all your all of the income we will control. We'll tell you what you can spend and what you can spend it on. I see. Doesn't seem like a good deal. You'll learn to love it. It's called Soma. Soma. Hold on. Soma. I uh, I remember Soma from a book decades ago. Soma was a medication that was given to people that allowed them to feel at peace, at ease, no stress, no drama, no trauma. They felt at one. They could just chill out constantly. Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Yes. And we will be able now to control through a chip all your neurological activities. It can read your thoughts. We have that right now. That exists right now. So... We can, when you're starting to get angry about something, we can change that image in your brain. When you're hearing a speech by someone and don't like it, we can change that to where you like it. So we're going to be able to control your thoughts and no more angst, no more, um, no more depression, no more mood swings. Isn't that great? So what will my life be like? Well, you won't be stressed. And you won't be poor, um, but you have to adopt to the common good. It's for everyone else's benefit. Oh, you, you want me to adapt to the common good. What if the common good is not good for me? A democracy is where decisions are made by people who have been elected for everyone's common good. But a republic is what we actually are. A republic. We've never been a democracy. Go back and read the Constitution. Republic for which we stand. And that takes care of the person being in charge of their life and the decisions they make and brings control back to the person and the state. Not some, not some completely opaque government bureaucracy. Well, that's the, you know, that's what you think, but it's really better. You're modeling it on the Chinese system of credit scores. We have to. It's a very good system. The Chinese people seem very happy about it. So in China, when someone jaywalked, immediately everywhere where that person went, if they were on a train or a plane, their picture came up on a monitor and said, this person just violated our standards and he's to be shunned. So if you read something the Chinese government doesn't like, it can cut off your opportunity to travel anywhere. You can't get on a bus, plane, train. You can't rent a car. You can't eat in a restaurant. You're excluded. Yes, and look how calm China is. Calm? Now, there have been hundreds of thousands of riots. We don't cover that. I see. What if you're a, a guy who watches porn in his basement? Because there's no work. He took a course, majored in something that there's no work for. Why is there any work? Well, because automation, transhumanism, um, artificial intelligence, and special visas took away our jobs. In fact, historically, the longer you worked in a career, the more seniority you developed. Larger pay, longer vacation time, greater benefits. And people look at you as a fountain of information. Oh, go, go over there to Charles. Or there's Mary. They have all the knowledge you need on this. They can answer anything. Well, Mary and Charles were making about $200,000 a year. Comfortable, upper middle class uh, income. They enjoyed life. Now, they bring in someone from Taiwan or from South Korea or India, 
who has a PhD, they're 26 years old, they're willing to work for 40,000 and no, no extras. And they can do the same work as Mary and Tom. And so now the entire seniority staffs around the United States are being just decimated. If you look in the newspaper, in the last two weeks, more than 30,000 Americans are being laid off. What's supposed to happen to them? Corporations don't care. Are these profitable corporations? Extremely profitable. So why would they lay off people? They want to be more profitable. So even though they're profitable making billions of dollars, they want to keep making billions. And so they just get rid of these worthless workers. Wasn't it... Uh, Dr. Harari, this major spokesperson for the World Economic Forum, who called these people useless and worthless. They're just eaters. They eat. But he's going to fix that because, as he said, everyone's going to put on that that eye, uh, the head and containment to show virtual reality movies all day long. So now you took the wrong courses in college or university, there's no job for you because artificial intelligence is taking it. So you stay in your basement of your mom's home and you watch porn or something. So now with artificial intelligence and transhumanism, they have a robotic that looks just like a human being, can have over a thousand different personalities, knows the answer to anything and is willing to be completely compliant with your wants, needs, fetishes, and desires. Oh, you think that's going to be popular? That'll be the number one selling thing in the world. Lonely people who feel they're too old or don't meet the physical uh, standards of other people to be attracted to them. Well, now they've got a companion. They can talk with them in a deeper way or more meaningful way than any human, they are told, and can do whatever they want. Wow. It's not like a rubber blow-up doll. These... You would not know these are not human beings. And whatever your desires, that's what they do. You can just have them specially made to everything that you want. Oh, I want that. I want uh, I want a guy that's uh, six five. Oh, I want a woman who's, you know, beautiful platinum hair. You can have it all. Now you can. You see where this is going, where manufacturers in Silicon Valley who are amoral. They don't care consequences. They just know that this is a trillion dollar market. So all in on it. Bring in the scientists, the ethicists, the professors, sociologists who will tell you why this is a good thing. Don't bring in anyone like the Gary and all or others uh, who will tell you it's not. They're baiting you. Now the latest is you can uh, go in, call up, ask a question, and instantly, within three seconds, they'll give you the most definitive answer in the world, and it'll probably be accurate. Over 100 million Americans have signed up for this service in the last two months. Because why go to Google any longer when this can do anything you want as far as asking for information instantaneously? Now, that's only using it in one area for information. But what if you want to find out something else? That's next up. They're rolling these out one at a time, and they're all on board. This was the fastest growing stock and valuation in a company in American business history. It went from zero to billions of dollars overnight. So what does that tell you about how deep the average American thinks on an issue and looks at the possible consequences if they acquiesce their freedom to do something on their own. Think of who this is jobs this is going to replace. First and foremost, do you think with all the diversity, teachers and instructors, and all the equity programs in the university and colleges, they really care about you becoming a critical thinker? No. They care about making money building up huge endowments, as they have. Duke, Harvard, Yale, huge endowments. If they allowed every single student to come for free for the entire duration of their degree, BS, master's, PhD, 
it wouldn't make a dent in their endowment. But they're not doing that, are they? They're charging more money every year. And what are they doing? They're giving you indoctrination. They're not teaching the critical thinking in most cases. So you're accumulating debt. How are you supposed to pay the debt? Well, when I get out of school, there'll be a job. No, you, no, 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 wrong. If we were honest, I would say at this moment, right now, that 70% of the people graduating from colleges and university, unless it's a very unique specialty, will not have a job where they can repay the debt. The debt's just going to accumulate. You might pay two to three times that debt in time. That creates depression, a living angst. So the game is rigged. So let's just see who you won't need now. Well, you won't need people who are um, researchers. Oh, and you won't need artists because they can create instant art. They can create any masterpiece that was ever there, but they can create original new art. Well, what if they can create new art? What if you can get them to create a piece of art? Now you call yourself an artist. It was created for you by this artificial intelligence. Burt Bacharach just died, one of America's greatest composers. He's right up there with, you know, um, Rogers and Hammerstein and uh, the Gershwin brothers and uh, Hart and all the others who we remember today. Will Porter. Wow. Burt Bacharach had 70 top 40 hits. That's a huge number of hits. And uh, he, he gave us music that we liked. I liked. I still listen to it. Um, and it's been used in every generation since he and how David created it. They, artificial intelligence, could now create, continue on with that music. So if he were not dead at the age of, I think, 93, um, he could tell it to create and tell it what he wanted to create and instantly in three three seconds it would create the music. So why will we need music producers? Why will we need authors? It can write a book for you in three seconds that would exceed James Joyce's writings or Hemingway or Tom Wolfe. Ref Scott Fitzgerald. So we're not going to need writers. We're not going to need editors. We're not going to need uh, copy editors or proof editors. We're not going to need advertising or uh, art directors because they can create the art campaign. They can create a public relations campaign. You won't have to study for a thesis. It can do your thesis. It can do your master's degree for you. Think of all the work that won't be needed now. Probably upwards of 70% of the American population over the next two years will be replaced. And why not? Silicon Valley leases you or rents you or charges you, if you're a corporation, to fulfill every job need they have and replace every job that you don't have. And they can do that instantly. You could have 20,000 employees and they would tell you instantly how many you don't need. They could reconfigure your entire employment. They could look at the records of every single employee you have and tell which ones shouldn't work and which ones should. You don't need a human resource person any longer. You don't need radio hosts any longer. Why? Because they can take any show that you want to develop and you tell them the criteria you want and immediately it can create a hundred a thousand programs, all original, all unique, at the highest end of the quality, depending upon the market you want to reach. It can rewrite any history and make it plausible. In effect, it's thinking for you. It's doing your homework, it's doing your research. What happens when we no longer use something in life? We lose it. Don't use your muscles, you lose your muscle mass. Don't use your intellect, you lose your capacity for critical thinking. You become lazy. You become just a, a person enfolding in all of the soma and then all the things that are done to you until you're just peering out, peering out into a world 
a brave new world where you're a voyeur. You're no longer essential. Now combine that with the World Economic Forum and BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street and Fidelity and uh, Berkshire Hathaway, the companies that own the greatest amount of assets. And now they're going to be using that on everything to make more profit, to have more control. Governments will use it. You could eliminate probably the entire CIA, FBI, Homeland Security. We're not going to need lawyers. Lawyers will be one of the first careers that are gone because it might take you, well, I'll give you an example. I, I've always had in-house lawyers because I have a lot of contracts that I sign and, and where they might look at a contract and it would take them maybe, I'll get this done today, Gary. Okay, four hours reviewing a contract and changing it. They could do the same thing in three seconds. And they'd be more accurate because they have every single legal case in world history. They have what the Supreme Court would allow and not allow. They would be able to tell you the best defense and the best offense legally. So why is anyone going to pay any lawyer $500 an hour? The legal profession will be wiped out in the next two years, in my opinion. There's no longer that area of specialization. Well, we're protected because we specialize in something. You're a mechanic. You specialize. What if the mechanic says, what would be the best way for me to configure a higher torque in this engine, greater horsepower, and what size block am I going to need? And suddenly, in three seconds, here's everything you need, everything, to make that happen. That could save you weeks or months of work. Everything that can be done will be done for the benefit of the person who pays for the service. But the major media, Google, Facebook, etc., and all the offshoot companies who are adding something new. So almost every part of your life will be controlled. If you saw the movie with Will Smith uh, I don't, some years ago, about uh, robots taking over. They're there. And what do you think will happen when a robot, artificial intelligence, is smarter than the programmer and the program? When they can rewrite their own program and hide what they've rewritten into an outsourced center that nobody knows exists and cannot find it. So you can't undo the damage. There's no turn-off switch. What would happen, for example, just, just as a, uh, a theoretical question, what would happen if you had a robot or you had an artificial intelligence that is the mind of a robot decide that it didn't like people? It wanted to kill people. They've actually, actually said that in filmed interviews. The robots did. And I can assure you, their programmers did not program them into them. The robots are smart enough to know the artificial intelligence is linked worldwide. The Internet of all things, well, the Internet of all things means your satellites are connected. Your electrical grids are connected. So let's just say that they decide to turn off the electricity completely. No cell phones, no television, no computers, no cars that work on electricity. No airplanes could fly, no ships could sail, no trains could run. Nuclear power stations would be turned off. There might be a 30-day backup supply on the grid of the, but it would be gone in two weeks to 30 days. That's all a nuclear power plant has to have as a backup power source. And all those fuel rods, boom. And when that happens, you're not going to be able to live within a 200-mile area of a city. Everything in that city, every asset, every building, every car, clothes, all be contaminated, like Fukushima. Just imagine, you can't preserve food. That's what's ever in your refrigerator within two to three days. It's melted, gone, not good can't buy anything because all the electric ways of doing with it is, is down. Oh, did I remember we had elect we had uh, we had the currency is now digitized. 
all currency is wiped out. So even if you were able to open it back up again, the virus that was put in there destroyed your balances. So it destroyed everything that was in your record. You have no record. So you say, okay, I had, you know, $200,000 of my life savings in there, gone. Well, put it back. I can't. We have no valid reference. You could say anything. We can't do that. It's gone. But we're going to give you $10,000 so that you'll at least be able to buy some stuff, food. That's what artificial intelligence gone rogue. How many times have we seen viruses escape from laboratories where we were told they were safe? Dozens of times. They just don't make news. Think of the surgeons who say, I'm a, you know, I'm a brain surgeon. Yeah, you're, and you're not able to do and think and work. We have an artificial intelligence that can make a better diagnosis and a better treatment than you can. You're gone. Hmm. Artificial intelligence could take over almost all the nursing with robotics and hospitals. You see where this is going? And that's what happens when you have an entire generation that lacks critical thinking. Individuals may, certainly. But as a group, everybody says, feed me, love me, distract me with entertainment, and make it decadent. Wow. Well, that's where we're at. You see, it's completely normal for all of us to need pleasure. It's part of the hedonic principle, hedonic meaning hedonism. At the low end of the scale, we all need the comfort and pleasure of a home, a roof over our head, clothes, food on the table, ideally food we enjoy that's healthy and delicious. We need to know that we have friends and we have some security in our life. These are hedonic principles. Then we need to know that we have people in our life that love us. We love them. The, the pleasure that comes from looking in the eyes of someone that you appreciate. Friends that you can laugh and be yourself who will not be critical of you. This is hedonic principles. When I go for a run every morning in a 15-acre uh, field out here, I'm running with a puppy, and it's just as rambunctious as possible. Grab a leaf here, grab it, you know, grab something there, run with it, drop it play, run with the cat, run with the other dog. And I just smile. It's, it's just happy time for me. And that's hedonic pleasure. <clears throat> Being able to go to the farmer's market and see some wonderful exotic foods that were locally grown. And someone said, oh, Gary, here's a special cherry from Argentina. Just got it. Harvested. Took eight years to grow, but here it is. Three bucks. Great pleasure in that. Pleasuring and seeing the friends that you appreciate succeed in things that are important to them. Going to a race, going to a ball game. Pleasure in that. Pleasure in sports, competing and spectating. Pleasure in reading a good book, listening to a great lecture. Pleasure. But these are all pleasures that are non-fatal. These are not. These are not hedonism at an extreme. When I watched the Grammys, only because a friend said, call me, you got to see this, Gary. <clears throat> you won't believe how decadent it is. I watched it. I found no talent. I found just a group, in my opinion, of extreme narcissist, egocentric people who didn't care about the world or anything except what was good for them. They needed, they needed some form of validation that they were still relevant. I'm still a superstar. I read, I walk the red carpets. Look at my outfit. You know, it doesn't matter. It's an ugly outfit. Doesn't matter they can't sing. Doesn't matter they can't dance. It's the idea that they can be extreme because they're in their element. That's decadence. The person who feels they can, they don't have to do anything. They're a superstar. Someone's going to get them their drugs. Someone's going to get them uh, whatever kind of uh, sex opportunity they want. I want this. I want that. Yes, yes, yes. All the while, these become enablers of extreme decadence. You wake up in the morning. Imagine what it's like to wake up as a superstar. You're just a human being, and you're grossly insecure. So everything you do now has to be extreme because you got to get attention. 
call the my agent, call my uh, go-to person. What if I did this? What if I were an all-meat uh, dress uh, to the Grammys? Yeah, Lady Gaga, that's a good idea. Not for the animals she killed, not for insensitivity, and not for the emptiness of self. You gotta, you gotta show that you're still relevant. We used to have people with real talent. How's that look today? We have taken mediocre and made it spectacular. We have taken people who are cloyingly annoying because they're constantly trying to get our attention by some extreme makeover. Faces that look like balloons that people paint a face on. I have empathy for those people because they're living in what I call the big empty. They have forgotten the spiritual, they have forgotten the ethical, they have forgotten the true meaning of life. <clears throat> being a success is not a meaning of life. And being successful in our society today is a poison because people take all the advantages to show how they extreme they can be. I got the biggest mansions. I just paid $2 million for this car. I got, look at this dress. You know, it's, it's $50,000 I'll wear at once. Look at all this bling. I got arthritis from having so much jewelry on that I overpaid 300% for every item. I buy it at super retail and I'll be able to sell it at a hop shop for pawn shop for below cost. Hmm. So we are a nation that knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. We don't know the value of true love and happiness, true friendship and loyalty, trust and commitment to higher ideals. That value we have forgotten. We had it, and some people still do. A lot of people still do. Younger and older still do. It's not everyone, but the policymakers and opinion leaders are stuck in the far end extreme from being happy and pleasures and simple happiness to extremes where there's no happiness in it. There's just stress of trying to show we can be more extreme than someone else. We're purely hedonistic. We're decadent. We make the people the 1920s in Germany and the 1920s and 30s in America, we make them look paltry by comparison to how extreme we are. Now, put that into the context that we are now a fractured society. We have been balkanized into thousands of tribes, and each tribe only lives with the paradigm that's been given, they fit into. Everything else is excluded, so we've disconnected from the essential interconnectivity of life. We no longer can appreciate differences in each other. Therefore, we want that censored. Artificial intelligence is aware of all this. Artificial intelligence will be able to dictate through the patterns in our brain what we should be thinking, what is the right thought, the right action. And for most people, except the stakeholders, the several hundred thousand who control this, for the billions of other people on the earth, we have no value at all. We're just consumers. And then the day will come when we no longer are needed to consume anything. Happy Silent Green Day when that happens. So that's where we're at. So I just want to share this with you. So before you get all enthused, I'm going to get the latest, greatest. I'm going to wait, stay in line, you know, at the Apple store for three days to get this because every single thing I ask, it immediately tells me it's going to solve all my problems, to answer all my questions. No, that's not how it's going to work. That's how they want you to believe it's going to work. It isn't. Go to GaryNall.com. Look under the articles that I've written on identity politics, the woke generation, critical race theory, balkanization of our nation, control over us. Become more familiar with what's happening right now. It's so common now that it doesn't even make the news. It's so common. So you got an identity card that allows you to get anywhere on any plane, train, buy stuff, don't have to have money. Boop. I walk in, show my card, and immediately don't even have to show it. 
something is my body, I can walk into a store where there are no cash registers because every single item in that store that's for sale has a code on it. And the code immediately reaches when I walk out of the store, it immediately has charged me for that. People think, isn't this great? Don't have to, you know, carry cash. No, it's not great. That's where they're taking us. And they're getting like 5G. Why don't you go to GaryNall.com and read the 12 articles I've written that show the dangers of 5G. But nowhere in the media, nowhere in government, nowhere in the EPA, nowhere in any scientific study that is promoted by the government where you see there's a problem with 5G. It's great, the internet of all things. It's not great. 10,000 studies show it's dangerous. But artificial intelligence will control the narrative, will control your access. Within this year, I believe you will not be able to find most information you need to make an intelligent choice. It'll be censored because artificial intelligence can prevent anything that challenges the corporate interest, the government interest from being revealed anywhere. And that's already happening now. Twitter showed us how that happens. Facebook acknowledged Zuckerberg that it did. He met with the FBI. It shows us how the deep state is controlling the messaging. And without the right messaging, how will you know what's true, objective, and balanced? You won't. They want to get rid of the jobs. They want to get rid of the people um, who are costing them money. It's all about power and profit. Something to think about. Go up on the internet while you still can. Download those who would challenge this and why, while you still can. Because I can promise you one of the things artificial intelligence will do, either by programming or if it's own programming, is going to make sure that there's only one truth, one narrative, and nothing else is allowed to exist. I'm Gary Anall, and that was our classroom on the air. Hope you find some value in it because the herd, the masses, no, no, they're doing exactly what the marketing people predicted they would do, mindlessly accepting whatever they're told without thinking of what the outcome could be. Have a nice day, everyone. Are you tired of closed-minded programming? Well, look no further than PRN.Live, the home for progressive voices.